Okay, so I'd like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Kenji Takada. He's a visiting industry fellow at the Alan Turing Institute and senior lecturer at the University of, um, so we're going to say Wolverhampton, Southampton, um, and director of the Microsoft Azure for Research program. I've known Kenji for many years, actually. We go back, what, 20 years, maybe 15 years, maybe? Um, <laughs> Um, so, um, Kenji's going to talk about some of the work he did with the British Library Labs a few years ago, and also some of the work he's going to be doing at the Turing Institute. Thank you very much. So, um, delighted to be here again, uh, occasionally come and give talks here, and um, it's really interesting, just this kind of combination of the British Library, uh, the Turing Institute here, uh, and some of the work that we have been doing at Microsoft Research uh, and are doing um, in the future that's very relevant to lots of things that we've heard about today. Um, you've heard a lot about the Million Images data set, which, which we scanned um, you know, several years ago, and we heard how UCL was using that um, in um, one of the projects. We actually, Microsoft and UCL run projects together. We ha have, I think, 10 or 20 projects again running this year across the whole variety of different domains. Uh, and it was really exciting to be able to kind of work together with the BL um, on that. And what's interesting is we heard this morning around um, that sort of evolution of how technology could be used in that sort of domain. Um, and here, when we started out on this project, Ben um, was working on the mechanical curator. And I think um, he said you know, he had the, the running in his office. Um, and he wanted to actually um, kind of make it a bit more robust and moving it to the cloud. Microsoft Azure allowed him to really experiment um, with what could be done. And I think that's what's really interesting when we look at what Jane was talking about with not being able to do research on your desktop. Um, this idea of cloud computing, um, the idea of having instantly available infinite amounts of computing and an infinite amount of data processing capability. Whether you're at UCL and have you know, one of the best kind of research computing infrastructures in the world, or whether you're working at home doing a part-time PhD in humanities, you can still have access to that infinite amount of computing and data processing that we've heard about today. And that's what's really kind of transformational about the work we're doing in the cloud and the work we're doing with the Alan Turing Institute, um, where we're very much trying to be very ambitious about what we can do and how cloud computing um, can enable that. And it can enable things, and this was one of the beautiful things I think that came out of that project for me, was that those images went beyond the research domain. Um, and I don't know if you saw the Burning Man exhibition here, but it was absolutely fantastic. I think even there was um, somebody in the US who did skateboards um, based on these, uh, these fantastic uh, images um, from a few centuries ago. And so we're continuing down this path. And if you're at the Tate, um, you'll see this exhibit called Recognition, where we've worked, um, some of our AI researchers have worked um, with a company called Jolly Brain to look at how AI can help us interpret art. Uh, and what they did was they built an AI system that would look at current news imagery from, for instance, Reuters, analyze those photos in the same way that the um, Sherlock Net um, project was doing but then also applying the AI to the collection in the Tate and trying to make that link between modern day news stories and art um, over the last half millennium or so. Um, so putting the human in the machine, this is one example that came out, which are a couple of eunuchs from Mumbai getting ready um, for, their, for their night, uh, matched to this 17th century picture. And what the AI did was it actually pulled out a number of features. I don't know if you could read this, so it pulls out things like gender. One of the things we have as a cloud service is an emotion API. So if you upload a picture, it will actually tell you the emotions of the people in the picture. And here, we can see actually the emotions neutral, but with other um, pictures, you know, they can be happy, they can be sad. Um, and also the context, the clothing, the background, um, object recognition. Um, and then what they did was take this as the input with the modern image, and then match it to the collection in the Tate to get something similar. And if you go on the website, microsoft.com slash Tate, you'll see other examples, for instance, pictures taken of Syrian refugees, for instance, matched to some images from hundreds of years ago in the Tate. Again, a fascinating insight into how our AI can actually help us as humans understand art. So AI not for replacing humans, this idea of rise of the robots is really something we don't believe in at Microsoft. We really believe in AI to empower people, and in this case, empowering people really to um, appreciate and understand art um, in new ways. And here, 
at the British Library, of course, you know, it's, it's a centerpiece of, of knowledge. And it's one of the things that Microsoft, again, you know, we have a search engine called Bing and we have a web archive. It's a current web archive and it goes back and it's one of a couple. Um, Google, you know, holds a similar sort of data set and we have a data set of the entire web going back. Um, but one of the interesting things is the idea of sort of topic map mapping and how do we map semantic relationships in these large sort of graph networks. And what's interesting is one of the best described graph networks that we have is the scholarly graph. And so the Microsoft academic graph backends Cortana, a Bing search engine, and is actually um, a graph of all of the world's publications since Proxoc A, all publications, all conferences, all workshops, all authors, all institutions, 50,000 fields of study as a graph. And as Andrew said, it's critical with these types of research artifacts that people are able to do it in the open. So if you go to this website, you can actually download the entire scholarly graph. Um, and we do updates every few months, so you can analyze it yourself. But as we heard earlier, that's quite difficult to do on your own machine, because this is hundreds of gigabytes in itself. And so what we're doing is making it available. We make it available through uh, something called Microsoft Academic. So it's similar to Google Scholar. I picked a random example of a, a researcher here. Um, and you can see, for instance, their publications. You can see their affiliations. You can see conferences they've published in, for instance. And again, that, that knowledge graph of those conferences come up on the right. CVPR is, is sort of world-leading conference in machine vision. And then, you know, the series of those conferences. So again, this is a front end to that academic graph. We have something called the Cortana Academic Assistant that we're working on as well. So this is how we've taken that scholarly graph. We've made it open to researchers, but we've put it as a service. And actually, we have a preview service here where you can sign up and link it to your profile. And so if you do want to have a look at this, um, do have a look at the, the preview of Microsoft Academic. Um, and we, we feel we're working, actually, we've created something called the Open Academic Society, which is a consortium of researchers using this data um, to look at the uh, scholarly communications as a research topic. So those were a few examples, but what I wanted to finish on was really how can you do this for yourselves? Um, and so some of the sort of tools and technologies and the, the Tate exhibition, uh, one of the things that's used there is to look at the emotions and some of the image recognition. And the Sherlock Net team had to build um, you know, a neural net um, to do that. But actually, you can just use the Cognitive Services API, which is a deep neural network with an API that does, for instance, that emotion recognition. And if you upload a picture, it will tell you where all the faces are, what sex they are, you know, whether they're smiling and all those um, things, and return it as a JSON file so you can use that. So it's a really one example of an API. The knowledge graph you can access through this academic knowledge API. So it's the only scholarly graph which has an API that allows you to do research on top of that. It's an API, so you think that's closed, but you can also get access to the raw data. So we try and do both. We make it really easy through a managed API that we, can, we own and manage, but also you can get access to the raw data so that you can do open science something we really strongly believe in at Microsoft. And then a couple of other services that you can go in the Knowledge Exploration Service where you could build natural language queries on top of your own data sets. I'm really interested to see what we can do here with the Turing and the BL. Um, and the Entity Linking Service, which does some quite sophisticated natural language processing. So these are just some of the tools under what we call cognitive services, which is really that state of the art AI. The AI behind this is the AI that won ImageNet, which is the image processing benchmark, and also the AI for speech recognition, which is, again, another very interesting topic, I think, in this area, um, which actually reached human capability. So it's an error rate of 5.9% in what's called the switchboard test, which is what humans achieve. So the speech recognition is getting really advanced now, which I think opens up a lot of possibilities um, around digital humanities um, research. And when we talk about open science, I've seen some slides of the Jupyter Notebook and one of the things with Jupyter Notebooks is you, you can create them and you can run them yourselves, but when you go to share them, you can share them on GitHub as sort of readable um, files. Um, but we've actually got a service called uh, Microsoft Azure Notebooks where you can freely host your notebooks, but share them, and these are executable notebooks. So you can run these notebooks in the cloud for free, share your research, create libraries, link to data sets, and share that. And actually, we've got people um, around the world using it, and Cambridge University actually using this for their first year engineering teaching in Python, for instance. So again, just 
new ways in which we can use computing just to make science, and particularly open science and open research, easier. Um, again, with the machine learning, which I think is a bit of a topic uh, we've seen today and certainly going forwards, um, it's a bit of a black art. We sorted, I don't know how much you um, understood of the, the Sherlock Net uh, presentation. I thought it was fantastic, actually, um, and a really good um, grounding in deep neural networks. Um, but if you're not an expert, um, this is a graphical workflow tool. This is actually a, a machine learning model for doing bespoke handwriting recognition. And so if you've got some text, you can train this to do handwriting recognition and then publish it as an API. Here we've got the ML Studio, which is the graphic bit in the middle. You, you load it with data, you train your model. The magic is on the right-hand side. With a click of a button, you can create an API with that and make that available to other researchers. And so, again, trying to make it easy, and it's one of the things, I think, where cloud computing um, is really, really interesting um, to try and make the um, research more open uh, and also more shareable. And then the other thing is, is this ability to have a machine that's bigger than what you have on your desktop. And so we often call those virtual machines, and we have a, a, a data science virtual machine that's got deep neural networks in there, um, databases. And you can spin this up on a huge virtual machine. Um, if you can't fit it on your desktop, you can spin up a machine in the cloud. Um, and it's what we're doing at the Turing Institute, for instance, helping the researchers there do bigger, better, faster, more reproducible um, research. And just is just a snapshot um, to show you some of them, I think, if you look at G over there, a 32-core machine with half a terabyte of RAM is quite useful for loading some of these data sets when you can do things and you can spin that up within a few minutes. So it enables you to do things that you possibly couldn't imagine doing yourselves. Universities can have these facilities, um, and so kind of understanding where you, can, um, where you can do that. And one of the things we're working with really is this is the toy box for researchers. So the cloud really provides anything you could ever hope for, including the deep neural networks and GPUs, petabytes of data, um, and that's really, really exciting for us at Microsoft Research, partnering with the Turing Institute uh, to see what we can do, partnering with the British Library and hopefully being able to work with all of you. Um, and to make it easy, um, the program that I run, that we've been running for several years, and actually the Mechanical Curator was one of the first projects we did here, um, is called Azure for Research. And this is an open call. It's every two months. Um, and that's my email address, and I'm, I'm around later. So do talk to me if um, any of this looks vaguely interesting to you and could help you um, with your research. We often think that it just makes you think a bit bigger um, to what you would think otherwise if you didn't have access to this type of computing. Thank you very much.